inspiration for this screening came from the vast collections of marine painting that are within the stores of the Scarborough Art Gallery. This is probably not a surprise considering Scarborough's location on the north coast and the industries in the town that relied on the sea from fishing, travel, trade and most recently tourism. The subject the sea, the subject of the sea as a subject for artists is long established, with many trying to capture the relentless force and energy of the sea water. But it was not always considered a high art subject matter. For example, in the Royal Academy of the Arts London during the 18th century, its president Joshua Reynolds commented on the genre's inferiority to the likes of history painting and it being outside the quote, traditional fine arts being a low and confined subject, end quote. Moving to look at the definition of the term marine, it's defined as referring to, quote, shipping or naval matters and also relating to things in or found in the sea, end quote. This description fails to acknowledge the sea as a subject in its own right, and thinking more widely in academic writing on marine painting, it is often the human elements of such paintings that are foregrounded rather than the sea itself. This screening then was conceived to reconsider this and think about the main subject that's often present in marine paintings, but often overlooked, the sea, water, and how contemporary artists and filmmakers are using and placing the liquid element at the heart of their creative practice. So, so turning to the collection of marine paintings when the archives of Scarborough Museum collection, which inspired the theme, highlight the various ways that humans interacted with the sea and water, and the different ways water is represented in paint. Starting with, the early, with this early 1668 Dutch painting, where we see Scarborough and specifically the castle from the sea, the patriotic painting highlights the power of the British, both on land and at sea, with the prominence of the castle structure and the boat representative of the Navy. Next, this work by T. Ramsey and the work Holiday Makers on Scarborough Beach. It shows the tourist trend for Scarborough and we see various members of the public taking the water, with sea huts both on the sand and in the water. This shows the medicinal quality people thought the sea could have on their constitution, and today the Pool of Scarborough as a tourist resort still persists, with the image of the water and the coastline used in a lot of external advertising, like this one. The Dutch are obviously long associated with inspiring the British tradition of marine painting, and the first painting I showed you was Flemish. It is said that well-known marine artist J. M. W. Turner, when standing in front of a seascape by William van der Velt the Younger, stated, quote, this made me a painter, a small indicator of the style and influence of Dutch marine work. The Dutch influence can be seen here in this painting by Newcastle-based artist John Wilson Carmichael, Dutch fishing boats from 1860. It shows a series of Dutch fishing vessels that came to Scarborough, attracted by the shoals of herring that proliferated in the area. This work then, like others in the collection, shows how humans have long had a connection with the sea. And it not only acts to record the trade, but offers a glimpse into the way the sea itself was often idealized by artists in this calm and serene manner, to really give prominence to the vessels on it. Water was, however, not always depicted as a calming force, such as in these examples, the wreck of the schooner Coupland off Scarborough on the left and terrific gale in the South Bay on the right. These show the sheer force of the sea as an element, tossing the boats around with ease. They also highlight the public fascination with such a spectacle, with both paintings featuring hundreds of people crowded onto the coastline, watching the natural drama unfold. The last style of marine painting that I wanted to highlight within the collection are ship's portraits. And for me, these are the most interesting. Often these are done by anonymous artists who had a number of other jobs, typically employed also as ship, house and sign painters. The practice of fine art, such as these works, would often have been restricted to their free time. These works would often be commissioned by shop, ship owners or captains to show off their vessels. And as you can see, both of the paintings show the ships from different angles within the same frame. These works would often be hung in offices of the trading companies or on the ships themselves. And the idea of viewing paintings on the sea itself is a curious thought. The moving undulating waves 
creating a non-static form of viewing. Just to note about this quick pictorial tour, and you may have noticed yourself, is that all of these paintings are by male artists. This is largely because painting was considered a more male pastime during the 18th and 19th century, and especially the subject of the sea and ships. But there are exam examples of women marine painters I have found, notably in the Hull, a woman artist created a number of whaling marine paintings. In all these works I've shown, and the subject of today's screening is the sea and water. And the title of the event, The Sea Around Us, is taken from the title of Car Rachel Carson's 1951 book. A well-known ecologist, this work highlights the interlinking of the sea, land, sky, sun and moon, and impact humans are having on water. A key and pertinent quote I wanted to highlight from this text is, as Carson states, quote, it is a curious situation that the sea from which life first arose should now be threatened by the activities of one form of that life. But the sea, though changed in a sinister way, will continue to exist. The threat is rather to life itself." End quote. This highlights that the sea will continue to exist long after us. The harm we are doing to the sea will only ever eventually impact on us. This brings me nicely onto the films that you'll see today as part of the event all of which have been chosen to place the sea water at the heart of the dialogue and highlight its potential to function as a personal, political and material force. The first short film you'll see is only 35 seconds in length. It is the first examples of film content of the sea by Louis Lumiere, forming part of the first commercial presentation of the Lumiere cinematography in 1895 Paris. It shows five men diving repeatedly into stormy seawater this would have been the first time people would have been able to see the constant moving of the sea without having to go to the coast. Next, you will see an extract from A Pond and Painted Ocean by Hondart Fraga. This animation is made from three Dutch 17th century oil marine paintings from Manchester Art Gallery. The work seeks to bring to focus back to the sea that is just a backdrop in the original paintings, which favour the military and economic power of the Dutch Republic. In the work, the action is also completely removed and all that is left is the impassive sea and its, and its constant rolling. The next work turns to think of the sea as a political force and is forensic oceanographies, the left to die boat case. The work, as the collection comments, offers a synthetic reconstruction of the events concerning what is known as the left to die boat case, in which 72 passengers who left the Libyan coast heading in the direction of the island of Lapidusa on board a small rubber boat were left to drift for 14 days in, NATO, in NATO's maritime surveillance area. It is a powerful work which highlights the constant currents of the sea and how it is used as a place of escape, but also exploited by nations to avoid offering aid and help. Next, you'll see the work Exterior Waves from the Exterior series by artist Daniel Clara. Their work, as you'll see, gives an intimate view of the sea. And in a statement about the film, they comment, quote, we decided to strip away as many of the other elements as possible and focus on the direct relationship between the recording device and the natural environment. This could be seen in a series of short meditations on surfaces. The surface element of our planet and the visual surface of the recorded image." End quote. The next two films you will see give an insight into the practice of Daniel and Clara and are taken from their Studio Diaries series where they spent several years living, living in an old beach house on the coast of Portugal. These diaries express their interest in the relationship between landscape, weather and the psyche, the impact of the environment, the impact the environment has on us and what we project onto it. The last work you will hear is a series of audio recordings from Museum of Water from Amy Sharrox, which is a collaborative work and, I quote, is an invitation to ponder our precious liquid and how we use it. I love this description from the website where it states, water is our most basic need and our most overlooked throwaway substance. We choose water metaphors to define our thoughts while in our actions we defend against it, squeezing and pumping it chlorinating and piping, soothed by our certainty that it will pour from our taps at the twist of our fingers. 
You will hear a number of recordings, three in fact, from the project from various contributors and Amy Sharrocks will explain the significance and context of these after the screening.